most widely accepted theory for the origin of the universe is the Big Bang Theory. In this scenario, an infinitely dense and hot point expanded to create time, matter, and energy we are witnessing here today. From this outburst, the first atom were able to condense only about 300 to 400,000 years after the Big Bang and were mostly hydrogen with some helium. And from these hydrogen clouds, it took an additional 180 million years for the first generations of stars to be born. These stars fuse hydrogen into helium, helium into carbon, oxygen and neon, slowly building up to iron and nickel. Beyond nickel 56, the S process for slow can generate heavier elements like zirconium and cerium. And slow means neutron capture happens before beta decay in the order of one neutron capture every few decades. These original stars were big and short-lived, ending their lives in supernova, releasing their content to the surrounding space with a final gift. The R for rapid process allows for yet heavier elements to be generated. Uranium, gold and rubidium are such elements produced during the short few seconds of the supernova where the neutron density per cubic centimeters is in the order of the Avogadro number. The shock wave triggered the condensation of a nearby hydrogen cloud and seeded the area with the newly formed heavy elements. Because iron and nickel made up a large portion of the core during the supernova, their abundance spiked. And because the R and S process favors some isotopes of others, the same ratio can be observed in meteorites and planets today. Just like chemical property explain noble gas and full electron shell, nuclear property explain magic numbers and isotope abundance. Because of tectonic and weather, it is difficult to find very old rocks to date our planet and put an age on the solar system formation. But some of this early material left over is still floating around they sometimes light up the sky when colliding with the Earth's atmosphere. So in this video, I will analyze two of the most common types of meteorites and try to establish an estimate for the age of the solar system and the Earth. I found them on eBay, and they even came with a certificate of authenticity. But if they turned out to be fake, I'll be able to find out very easily. This one was found in Argentina and is reported to be part of a larger meteorite that fell 4,500 to 5,000 years ago. It is mostly made of iron and weighed about 23 grams. This one was found in Northwest Africa, is more rocky in nature, and weighs about 67 grams. There is good reason to believe it was once part of 433 Eros, an asteroid about 16 kilometers wide, currently orbiting the Sun between Earth and Mars, and could potentially one day impact either of these planets. For now, neither of these meteorites display any radioactivity. And the XRF reveal iron and nothing else. Looking for trace metals and isotopic ratio, and the part per billion and trillion is a job far beyond my mass spectrometer's ability. So I called in the favor from a friend at my old lab and used their triple quad ICPMS. In May of 2019, I traveled to Colorado and New Mexico to get some samples from the KT battery and analyze them for iridium. This element concentration is a good indicator for extraterrestrial origin of rocky samples. Iridium concentration in earth crust and dirt usually never exceed about 50 parts per trillion. Both of these samples have a higher concentration of iridium. The Campo del Cielo metal meteorite measured at 1.3 part per billion or 1300 part per trillion. Another way to be sure is to look at the chromium isotopic ratio and compare it with the natural abundance. The difference is small 
to the 4% between chromium-52 and chromium-50, but it's significant enough to determine these meteorites are real. And now that we know that, let's take a look at the isotopic ratio for other elements and trying to date these space rocks. I wanted to use four method for radiometric dating. The uranium lead duo, lead lead couple, neodymium and samarium ratio, and the rubidium and strontium system. This last one was particularly difficult as rubidium 87 and strontium 87 are isobaric and interfere with each other. Separating them with the mass spectrometer is a difficult process and is beyond the scope of this video. Lead 204 is the only isotope of lead generated by the supernova. And lead 206 is the final stable isotope of uranium 238. I've talked about it in a previous video, link in the description. Knowing this, we can calculate how long lead 206 have been accumulating, knowing it came from uranium 238 entirely. And using this simple equation, and based on my analysis, we arrive at an age of about 2.2 billion years. So I detected too much lead or not enough uranium, or both. The lead to lead dating is a technique based on the constant presence of non radiogenic lead 204. Without too much details, this ratio allows for this azochrome curve to be established and the driver to be assimilated into this equation. This equation was found in the excellent book Radioactive and Stable Isotope Geology. My analysis yield the results for the age of this meteorite of 6.4 billion years. Using the same isochrone method, I looked at the samarium-147 and neodymium-143 using neodymium-144 as a reference. Because of the long half-life of samarium-147, over 100 billion years, I did not expect to see much on the curve. But using the same uranium-lead equation, I got 2.9 billion years. Looking at the rubidium-87 over strontium-87 and using the acylchrone method yield the best results at 3.78 billion years. For reference, the actual accepted figure for the age of the solar system is 4.5 billion years. But my results are within 15% and the right order of magnitude. The reason for the difference can be seen in the data set on the isochron curve. Not all the points align with the function, and this is a typical sign of mixing or contamination. Maybe a collision happened between asteroids with exchange of material, and possibly some melting. Sample collection, handling, and preparation could also be at fault. Radiometric analysis remains a powerful method for dating geological samples, but unfortunately requires expensive equipment. I do accept donations and early Christmas present. In all, I use the best data from the best sample. The Campo del Cielo meteorite was rich in iridium but uranium deficient. And the Rocky sample had more rubidium and samarium to be useful but digested poorly in nitric acid. But overall, I am still satisfied with my results. I learned a lot with this project, and I hope you did too. Thanks for watching.